the cloud perhaps. Well, it claims to be doing it. Yeah, okay. Hopefully that's doing it. And um, if I get a link at the end of this, which says it actually recorded it, I'll, um, I'll share it with everyone as a follow up to the session. Okay. I hope people are following on. So let's go uh, back and have another look at our controller node now. So there's uh, two several interesting things that have happened. Uh, firstly, we've gained some new users, uh, collar and stack. Uh, we've gained some bridge devices. Uh, we've gained a Docker runtime, but no Docker containers. So uh, uh, other things could happen too. We could have um, LVM configuration, for example. Um, we could have um, um, other things besides this in terms of repos and um, and what have you. So there's, there's uh, a good deal of preparation work that can be done at this stage um, in order to make our, our bare bones sort of CentOS VM into a working thing. Let's uh, start the next bit, which could take a little while. Container image pull. At this stage, what we're doing is um, we're bringing down all of the uh, Docker container images uh, to the control plane, uh, so to the controller and to the hypervisor, the compute node. And this, this will be done according to the OpenStack collar configuration. And, um, and so which services are defined to be running and placed on which, uh, which compute nodes. And so um, what will be happening here is that we are talking to our local Docker registry, uh, which is inside the, um, inside the deployment in Equinix Metal and local to the region, but is not on the uh, CDVM. And it'll be, it'll have a list of containers to um, uh, to download. And I can show you where that comes from. I'll just change tabs again while it's doing that uh, download. So back into the KOB uh, config uh, repo, our infrastructure is code. There's a file called collar.yaml. And this is largely at defaults. I think that means that we're not going to get anything special. Uh, the only significant difference here is uh, we're not going to be enabling Ironic. So we're, by default, the control plane includes the Ironic service uh, for managing bare metal in certainly up to the Usuri release. And uh, so if, if any of these um, uh, collar enable uh, flags had been set and they were not the default already, uh, then we would start to be pulling in those container images uh, for that. And within the universe from nothing lab environment, um, it's perfectly possible and readily available to uh, to change the configuration from a running setup, run the playbooks again and have it reconfigured to the new setup. Let's see how it's doing. Still a little way to go. If we were doing this on a running machine, so for example, if we were updating some of the versions of our, our containers and you can update them on a very fine grained basis. So you can easily do um, one service and update it from uh, one point release to the next, um, then pulling the containers has no effect on the running system. It's simply staging the software images um, local to where they are running in a way which then enables us to shut down the, um, the 
active instance and replace it with a new version of the active instance in a uh, in a fairly fairly snappy way now uh, so that the time that any single uh, server is um, is doing the upgrade is is the time it takes to restart a service uh, for one uh, but also collar ansible has the logic of orchestration so things like uh, the stateful services uh, the databases and the message queues uh, the updating of those across the control plane is done in a orchestrated way where the disrupt there is no disruption to the service while this update is happening my system has uh, completed the pull of containers now this is a bit that could easily go wrong um, with um, everybody in the lab pulling from uh, uh, from the local registry so if you hit problems uh, with yours do shout out and um, and hopefully um, uh, mark or john could um, step in and help you uh, help you get uh, get the bits that are missing Over cloud service deploy then is the process of writing the configuration into the um, uh, the controller node and the compute node uh, for the services that we're going to deploy, and then starting them up in a um, in a coherent fashion. The way that it does this in um, in the collar model is um, is quite nice. It, it it works seems to work quite well, and I can just uh, quickly take you through uh, the different stages in which um, uh, the configuration of different containers is is written, because collar is is what you might call opinionated. It has uh, defaults for pretty much everything um, that you want to do, apart from parameters that simply cannot have a default value on any every configuration. And that means that the actual configuration that, um, that we need to worry about is where we differ from essentially a reasonably sensible set of defaults. And, uh, and that means that the configuration that, uh, that we store under source control is, is not unduly big and, uh, and uh, is as simple as it can be without being, being simpler than that. I'll show you a little bit about how that works um, and the different stages in which configuration makes its way from our KV config repo onto the running machine. Uh, there's, there's three key stages, maybe four. So I'll just change terminal again uh, to uh, our config here. And inside this uh, directory, there is a subdirectory called collar. And inside there is one called config. And this is where we can put a lot of um, service specific config in a very fine grained way. Uh, so that now we're thinking particularly about um, specific files or specific data that we might want to add to files inside the um, OpenStack control plane configuration. So it's really quite targeted, uh, quite precise in terms of the conf config that we're applying here. There's several ways that we can apply data. And the first of them is that there will be a service.conf file um, in pretty much every OpenStack service. Uh, so for example, here we have Neutron, and there is some custom configuration here, which is applied to a file called neutron.conf. And so pretty much every OpenStack service has a service.conf kind of naming convention. And um, so that the easy pieces uh, we can apply usually go in there. Uh, what we can see here is a fragment of an any file, uh, but it's got some uh, ginger parameterization to it as well. Uh, so we can see this variable AIOMTU, and that actually is um, expanded from our, our set of KOB variables, um, which were a couple of directories up in um, the networks.yaml. So just here. Uh, we can see that this is this is a symbolic representation of the MTU run hour all in one network. And that that's quite a powerful thing for a start. Um, that in our neutron.conf we can add particular random fragments of config 
and refer to them in this sort of symbolic algebra of our our um, our KV configuration, so that we don't have to carry around a load of numbers and repeat the numbers everywhere and then change them everywhere as well. The next level of detail is uh, within the neutron uh, service. We might have other config files which to which don't follow this sort of um, fairly simplistic naming convention. And so we have ml2conf, for example. And so within a subdirectory in our caller config directory, uh, we also have a place where we can put other files which will all be transferred over into the, um, the running configuration of our services. So again, um, ml2config also has a variation on the theme in terms of uh, this parameter path MTU. And this will be inserted into other configuration, other global config uh, that Kola will be applying on the, uh, the machine itself. We can go further than this, and actually we can make um, subdirectories within uh, these subdirectories and say that we can apply specific service to specific groups within our control plane inventory. So for example, a good, a good use case for that could be that we have a group of GPUs, uh, GPU enabled hypervisors, and perhaps we want to be able to pass through PCI whitelist details specifically on those servers and not on others. And so there's a nice way that we could just create a, a group within our um, caller config here, specifically for Nova config for a group of servers, and that config would be uniquely contained within those servers. So it's very powerful and very flexible, but at the same time, it's, it's very intuitive and uses Ansible's inventories to its strengths. The next stage in which that um, config is, um, is passed is that if we go back up to the top of our KV config directory, we get this sort of macro expanded uh, collar configuration as well. And if you remember that KB drives Collar Ansible uh, to, um, to manage the orchestration of deployment of containers. So, oops. within um, the, the Collar configuration then, and um, I think it, there's a neutron.com, there we are. So the color configuration looks pretty much the same, uh, apart from that our parameterized KB variables have been expanded. So details from the infrastructure have become, um, gone from being symbol symbolically represented to being concrete instantiations of, of those parameters here. Uh, but this by itself, you know, you'd, you never have a one line neutron config. So the other, the next stage is then that the other details that Collar is going to be applying based on the parameters of the deployment will be um, feathered into this um, this ini file as well. And if we go on to the uh, uh, the control plane itself, uh, so if I go on to um, the controller node, and if I become root, the the final or the, the next stage of the uh, the path of the flow of configuration is that there is a directory on all managed nodes, all the nodes on the control plane called etc. Collar. And within this directory, there are subdirectories for all of the containers that are being deployed. And um, right now, we haven't quite got to the point where Neutron has worked, has gone through yet. So we probably are a little bit ahead of um, the service deploy here. I think it might be coming up soon. But what's going on is that the, the Nova configuration files are being written and the containers will be being deployed here. I'll go back to the um, controller node and we can see that happening. Yes, so it looks like Nova API came up uh, 17 seconds ago. So that's very much still underway.
another interesting interesting piece here is that we can see um, the container releases that we have here. Um, so most of the um, collar containers will just be pulling from, from builds upstream. Uh, we have the option to build our own, and there's two ways that we can do that. Uh, the binary path is simply to um, uh, create a, a root image and install RPMs into it from, from the RDO project. And the source image, uh, the source uh, container kind is where we pull down the tarballs or the uh, Git checkouts. And, um, and essentially um, we go past RDO and we, we install it from the, uh, from the sources themselves. In terms of the tags, um, Usuri is a rolling release branch of um, uh, stable releases, but um, we also have um, uh, point versions made within a release cycle. And so it's also perfectly possible to pin to a single point, point release. Uh, which gives you uh, greater um, uh, repeatability of um, uh, the containers that are being deployed from one day to the next. It looks like Neutron is on its way now. Okay, so over here we're gaining a few directories and um, our neutron.conf, uh, for example, should have the MTUs and there is the MTU parameter interleaved with a lot of other uh, configuration parameters that have been as applied by uh, Collar and Spill as well. This is the um, uh, the longest stage in the uh, in the exercise because it can take a a good um, a good amount of time to get through the deployments of the OpenStack containers and their configuration. Looks like we're nearly done. Okay, so on this system, the uh, uh, the OpenStack control plane is up, and actually we can source the um, uh, the overcloud credentials that were generated uh, by this deployment. So, and um, I'm in the wrong directory so that for this source config source kb config etc collar public open rc collar generates this file with them um, with the credentials of um, uh, the cloud it's just deployed um, just an rc file so with the um uh, the public credentials of the system uh, we can now do a post configure uh, which doesn't do much in these systems. Um, usually it's the point where we would be downloading things like um, Grafana dashboards and setting up pieces for um, ironic management as well. So things like the, uh, the RAM disks and the other pieces needed there. So we just run it for completeness. Okay. So um, I've just uh, sourced the public RC, but now we can look at um, uh, pulling down things like a, a Cirrus image and um, uh, defining flavors and, and, um, and networks and other pieces that we might need to uh, um, boot a machine.
I think at this stage, uh, there's a script that we can run, which is in the um, in the Google Doc, which comes with this um, presentation, which I'll just open here. I'm going to run this again because quite often I think that as part of the lab environment, we we do some things to the um, the host VMs networking, the host instances networking, and uh, I think we need to rerun this script. So I will just type that in. And what this does is it sets up um forwarding and some ports to connect to okay now we can um, we step away from kobe and we start interacting with the uh, uh, the system itself uh, the openstack through its um, own apis i'm going to leave the kobe environment set up here and I'll go over to one of the other um, uh, terminals or tabs on my um, my Tmux. Oh, I'm rude, that's why, excuse me, long day. Okay. And I will also source the uh, other caller credentials here. Okay. So now I should be able to um, create a, um, a VM and I'll just check if my um, OpenStack environment is uh, set up. Run some simple commands. I think m1.extralarge is um, probably pushing our luck. So let's uh, go for a tiny. Uh, there's some preloaded state here, which should just make this command the same for everybody. There it goes. And the machine is created. So we have a VM running. Um, Let's step on though and see how uh, how well it works. So make a uh, floating IP. Uh, the the scripting there is um is an easy way to see uh, or to extract the floating IP programmatically, but I. I will just use some um, copy and paste here. So we have, uh, this is our floating IP. Obviously, this isn't meant to be an external network, but in the lab case, uh, the setup local networking that we're doing is doing some IT, IP tables translations so that we can use any public IP address on the outside and, um, and translate it to a quasi public external network here, which is 1002. Add that floating IP to my VM. And there it is. So I should now be able to 
SSH to my VM and hey presto, there it is. So we've right, we've made an OpenStack deployment and we've actually made a VM inside it. And now we can connect to our VM and you can see it's a, a one core uh, 512 meg, uh, not very big VM, but uh, it's enough to demonstrate uh, that we can make these test environments on one server uh, for a multi-node or representing a multi-node control plane. Uh, there's a little bit more we can do as well as that. So if, um, if you remember the IP address you had from your email, um, if you've deployed the control plane, you should be able to open your um, uh, web browser to that um, IP address and see Horizon work. And, um, you can also get it from Bonzira here, I believe. So if I open a tab here, uh, you should see a login on your OpenStack web interface. Now, what was the password again? It'll be the same one. The admin account um, is from the same credentials that we had before. So I'll just make this a bit bigger. And there we are. So that is our, our little VM uh, running inside our lab environment and um, accessible from, um, uh, from your machine. How are people doing? We've got a, a few minutes um, available to uh, uh, complete any um, any problems people have had if they've people have not quite made it to the end. Uh, but I wanted to go on to um, show you guys the uh, what we could do next. And um, I'm afraid that um, in an hour and a half uh, we don't have a lot of time to. Uh, uh, to cover some of the sort of follow-on exercises, but I will, I will take you through what they look like as well. So, the first one, and th these are covered in the in the handout as well, actually. So, if you're if you're interested in understanding, now that you've made your um, uh, your universe from nothing environment, uh, you can use it in all kinds of ways to um, uh, to understand more about the different ways that we might transform an OpenStack control plane to add services, to make changes, uh, to understand it better and how to work it. Um, it's quite easy to take this environment and develop it further. And there's a few nice examples in the, um, in the handout, uh, which you're very welcome to have a look at and, uh, and work through. As I say, please do, um, do try this at home um, because there's, um, there's a lot of things that we can do there. So I think um, if I go back to the controller node, um, we can see the full set of Docker containers that um, have been deployed, uh, more than a page here. So let me just um, bring that down a bit. And so um, uh, this, is, this is what a, a collar control plane looks like, a, a suite of containers um interacting through um message buses and um and apis rest apis and things and not interacting through common file system or other things like that on this machine um a a default vanilla config of um, um collar will have fluent d aggregating logs between all of the, um, the different services but basically there won't be um any uh, sort of developed logging service, any, any really sort of user-friendly logging service. So Fluentd can easily be configured to send data to other places, um, forward it onto set, um, host logging infrastructure, that kind of thing. But actually we can create our own as well. So we can, um, with one line of conf config change, 
uh, we can deploy a uh, an elastic search and cabana deployment to take all of the logging from fluentd and um, and present it in a um, interactive exploration way uh, using cabana it takes a little bit more than the time we have now i'm afraid uh, but it's um, it's well worth doing if um if you're interested it it's surprising how well Elasticsearch will work in a limited footprint like this. Surprises me anyway. Um, in terms of other exercises uh, that we have here, one of the really nice things that we can do in, um, in uh, KB uh, configuration, given that everything is Ansible driven, is that it's quite easy to generate all of the configuration from uh, a, uh, all the effect of a um, parameter change in our configuration, expand everything into the final level of expansion, which would be the config files written into the host's uh, config directories themselves. And then also then, then enable us to bring that back and then compare it with what's currently active on the system. And so if you were ever worried about what the full effect of a change is, uh, this is a way in order to enable you to see the full effect of a config change and then understand well actually it's changing a little bit more than i expected it would and so you can you can look before you leap uh, you can it means that every OpenStack reconfiguration isn't a leap, leap of faith you completely understand the consequences of it in terms of um, um, OpenStack configuration state changes so that's um that's a pretty cool thing as well and it's a it's all facilitated through um, uh, using these Ansible models. Um, there's a couple of other nice exercises um, I should call out uh, before we go too far. So uh, we've looked at Elasticsearch and Gibana. Um, that was that one. If you have, um, if you've ever enabled Skydive, uh, that's quite a cool thing to add here. Um, Skydive is the um, the interactive um, uh, network analyzer, which enables you to uh, understand how um, OpenStack's uh, neutron hypervisor networking configures string sticks together. And so it's quite an intuitive um, uh, graphical presentation of hypervisor networking. Well worth a look if you're interested. I think now though we've only got um, a couple of minutes left so were there any questions uh, that anyone would like to raise at this point uh, that we could cover before we finish um i see a comment about um SROV um, networking. Yes, that fits in well here. Um, so it's a nice example of how we can use the uh, the deployment hooks so that um, uh, if we have um, specific hardware from a, an SROV supporting vendor, uh, we can set it up in our host boot process in a way which is um, which works for that class of NIC and then set up the, in the environment as well. Uh, similarly, for some of the more advanced sort of um, hardware offloadings, things like um, ASAP squared from Mellanox as well, uh, those things can be configured as using the uh, deployment hooks so that they fit into the steps, the steps of the standard process um, and extend it in, in useful ways. There's a question on any um, any docs on how to start with Colo and KB for production environments. And uh, Lucas, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, the OpenStack um, online documentation for KB, I think, makes an excellent reference um, for uh, uh, for getting set up. The um, the sort of this end to end approach of um, uh, deployment. Sometimes it's nice to start with a, um, a reference example uh, for uh, 
another cloud that's deployed using uh, the Kobe environment as well. And if you look in the Google Doc uh, that was the handout with this um, this session, uh, there is actually an example of a, a production system. So it's a an OpenStack cloud for a radio telescope um, project in um, at, um, here in the UK. And that uh, config should be a good example of uh, reference implementation for various um, scientific computing like facility um, features quite useful to get started but the the online documentation for Kobe is is um, I think very very good very um, very articulate and uh, explains a lot of the um, reference details quite well Okay, um, we should probably uh, probably stop at this point. Um, thanks a lot, everyone who's um, made it through. I hope you've uh, found it useful. Um, I think it's uh, it's it's a good fun environment, and I, I like I said, I'll say it again. I, I do hope you'll um, you'll take it away and and have fun with the uh, the Universe from Nothing workshop. It's all open, and we we look after it. Um, so it, it usually. Uh, um, usually works pretty well. We we add new exercises to it all the time as well. So I'll um, I'll follow up in an email if um, if the recording is uh, is successful and uh, with the details so you can uh, take that. Yeah, uh, good point, Mark. So uh, KB and um, collar and spill and collar on IRC OpenStack collar is um, is a helpful channel. Um, there's people from all over the world in there, so it's uh, usually pretty busy. Yep. Oh, go for it, Stanislav. Um, the seed node will deploy all of the servers in the control plane, including storage and um, and hypervisors. If you, uh, by default, it will do all of those. Um, so we often deploy a Ceph cluster, uh, which is connected to, well integrated with, but usually slightly separate from the OpenStack environment on its own hardware. And so it, it's, it's perfectly possible to deploy a wide range of other uh, pieces of the infrastructure um, using the seed node approach. You can deploy pretty much anything you choose to um, with that system. Okay. Um, in the uh, the reference architecture, there is ironic. So, ironic is just being used to deploy anything that is um, any of the servers in the control plane. Um, does that answer your question, Sergey? I think it's um, um, it's not about uh, providing ironic to users. It's about using ironic to install the compute and the control plane, all the resources. Uh, Warren, I think um, uh, the the VMs are going, or the the lab instances are going to be up today, and um, I think they'll disappear um, either overnight or first thing tomorrow. Okay, well, good luck, everybody. Um, hope I'll see you all around, and um, and thanks a lot for uh, making it to the end. Cheerio. <laughs>